The My Lai Massacre exposed internal conflicts and moral compromises that soldiers faced during the Vietnam War in adhering to the law of war as prescribed in the Geneva Convention, requiring the preservation of civilian lives while risking one's own life. The law of war endeavors to confine war's destructiveness and protect civilians during armed conflicts. Under the 1949 Geneva Convention, 196 countries agreed to protect persons taking no active part in the hostilities against violence to life and persons and all kinds of murder. Two principles protecting civilians were articulated. The first principle required belligerents to distinguish between civilians and combatants and direct their operations only against military objectives. The second principle required that combatants ensure that the loss of life and damage to property must not be excessive in relation to the military advantage gained. The Geneva Convention, however, also allowed exemptions to these principles, and in 1956, the U.S. Army clarified that persons who are not members of armed forces, who bear arms or engage in other hostilities, deprive themselves of privileges of the civilian population. The internal conflicts and moral compromise inherent in these principles and exemptions were exposed in My Lai. Despite all parties signing the Geneva Convention, violations were commonplace on both sides including torture, murder, and rape. In particular, the war's singular greatest atrocity, the Hue Massacre of 5,000 civilians by North Vietnamese forces, occurred six weeks before My Lai. On the morning of March 16, 1968, 1st Platoon Charlie Company led by Lieutenant William J. Calley entered My Lai 4 without encountering armed opposition and began to round up villagers. Soldiers began burning buildings, but Lieutenant Calley then ordered and took the lead in the execution of non-combatants. Before noon, up to 407 villagers, 80% of My Lai's population was dead. The Piers Inquiry, an army investigation into the massacre, revealed that internal conflicts and moral compromises were evident in the soldiers' actions. First, the army's emphasis on body counts dehumanized both enemy and civilians alike. Second, the tactics of guerrilla warfare desensitized soldiers' perception of who was the enemy. Charlie Company lost 21 of its 136 members due to booby traps and mines a few weeks before the massacre. My Lai residents were known to be sympathetic to the Viet Cong, and their lack of injuries suggested to the U.S. soldiers that they knew the location of mines and traps, but did not warn American troops. Consequently, Charlie Company held the locals culpable in their comrades' death and maiming. Third, the Pierce Inquiry found Lt. Kelly's leadership instigated and encouraged the massacre rather than prevented it. He was eventually tried for the murder of 109 civilians. U.S. military success in Vietnam was based on a kill ratio, so the more enemy deaths, the greater the victory. This created an internal conflict to the very essence of the law of warfare, which allowed for the destruction of an enemy's fighting capability while preserving human life. Conventional warfare's ineffectiveness against Viet Cong guerrilla tactics also led to a conflict between U.S. military strategy and the law of war. These conflicts served the base for Lt. Calley's defense. You, the jury, must proceed to determine whether, under the circumstances, a man of ordinary sense and understanding would have known the order was unlawful. Lt. Calley claimed that his orders indicated the village was a military target, and therefore the inhabitants were the enemy. Testimony, however, varied as to the order's intent. You see, the uh, Viet Cong does not itself follow international law, which requires guerrillas to wear distinctive signs, to wear uh, arms openly and so on. This is not convenient to them, they don't follow it. But that means that our side finds it extremely hard to distinguish between a peasant and a guerrilla. The man who scratches himself to the pilot may very well appear to be taking a weapon and be about to shoot at him. As a result, I think it is 
in this case, uh, you're quite right, innocent people suffer, but let me point out that isn't the nature of war. I felt then, and I still do, that I uh, acted as I was directed. I carried out the orders that I was given, and I do not feel wrong in doing so, sir. If the officer that gives you the directive does not do so because he just likes to see that Hamlet go up in flames, but because he has plausible and reasonable grounds to believe that that Hamlet has a military target that justifies its bombing. The most discussed source of the moral compromises that resulted in the Milai massacre relates to Lieutenant Calley's leadership. He failed the 90-day officer candidate course three times for leadership. In its desperate need for officers, the Army's passing rate rose from 40% to 90% during the Vietnam War. Cali's order for soldiers to end innocent lives psychologically damaged the soldiers under his leadership. Lieutenant Cali was responsible for murdering innocent children and the elderly. The massacre severity was initially held back from the public to prevent an even more extreme backlash against the war and to protect the army's reputation. How people would have reacted to knowing the true numbers and extent of Lieutenant Kelly's acts will never be known. But the 109 killings for which William Kelly was tried and the 22 for which he was convicted caused him to become a galvanizing reason for both supporters and opponents of the war to demand an immediate U.S. withdrawal. Both hawks and doves transferred the responsibility for the murders to America's military and political leaders and to the war itself. Cali's life sentence of hard labor was eventually reduced under constant public pressure to four years of house arrest. Milai impacted U.S. diplomacy worldwide. The British government's ability to support U.S. war efforts was irreparably damaged. Germany commented coyly on America's Nuremberg experience, while France saw it as a cost of war. The army responded to the Milai massacre by dramatically increasing training on adherence to the law of war, emphasizing the protection of non-combatants. The real impact of our work was on the army itself and tried to bring these people to justice. The fact that the effort was made did survive, that it survived in the Army War College and in the Command and General Staff School. It had led then to field manual writing, which spelled out the training that must be given to soldiers about war crimes. It, it is still part of the history and of the genes of the United States Army today. Yet violations still continue. Most recently in Hadidith, during the Iraq War, four Marines were charged with killing 24 civilians. 18 of the 24 deaths were attributed personally to the squad leader, showing that individual moral compromises remain the determining factor in the fate of persons on the battlefield. Both atrocities show the impact one soldier can have on the international community. The Milai massacre epitomized and revealed the internal conflicts and moral compromises that combatants face when fighting an intangible enemy. Any law in of itself cannot enforce standards. It is truly up to the individual to adhere to its intent and for society to suitably apply the law to violators. When a conflict no longer has clearly defined battle lines, mixing combatants and non-combatants, the toll upon individual soldiers can lead to moral compromises that violate the rules of war. Soldiers who must choose the best course of action in moments of true distress and urgency must uphold the society's highest standards, preserving life even at the cost of one's own life.